Hi, this is uh, Dr. Peter Coey in Philadelphia, uh, in, actually in Wynwood, Pennsylvania, and uh, the program uh, that we're going to uh, have for you today has to do with um, QT interval measurements uh, as they relate to car the safety of cardiac and non-cardiac drugs. Um, I'll uh, stipulate here at the beginning of my presentation that I uh, do consult for a number of pharmaceutical companies, uh, most of which are, or some of which at least, are listed on this disclosure slide. Um, I uh, don't have any equity interest in any pharmaceutical company, and uh, the work that I do to consult on these issues that we're going to discuss today uh, is an ad hoc uh, hourly, on an ad hoc hourly basis. Um, so just so you're aware of that. Uh, and, and in addition to that, I'll also stipulate that uh, nothing that I'm going to discuss today has any proprietary implication. Um, uh, since I'm under a number of co confidentiality agreements, we're not going to be talking about anything that is not in the public domain. I'm going to um, just ask a few rhet almost rhetorical questions at the beginning of this talk because they help to really focus the main issues that we're going to discuss today. Uh, the first is, uh, do you think that looking at uh, each new chemical entity that comes through a developmental pipeline for its torsad liability is a, is a good idea and whether, the, and whether or not this should apply to biologics? Um, I'm not sure that any of these questions have a correct answer, but it's just sort of a judgment as to whether this might be a good idea. Uh, the next question is do you think assessing drugs for torsad liability is feasible? Is, is it something that we can um, understand using current methodology? And we will be talking about some of those methodologies as we, as we proceed today. Uh, do you think that a small change in QT interval is associated with some kind of a risk of torsad and can that be quantified? Obviously a very important question. So we're going to be talking about a specific electrocardiographic measurement called the QT interval, and uh, I'm sure that most people on this call have some idea of what this is. It is an electrocardiographic parameter measured from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. Um, and what, we're, what we posit is that patients who have long QT intervals are susceptible to the development of a particular form of ventricular tachycardia called torsad de Pont. Uh, this is a, an arrhythmia that is recognizable not just by its morphology, which is on this slide, uh, but also by, the, by a very unique initiation pattern of a short, long, short uh, initiation cycle, um, and obviously uh, a prerequisite for the diagnosis is a prolonged QT interval. The problem with this, this area that we're going to discuss today is that um, QT interval prolongation itself is not the issue. Um, we really don't think that there's any negative things that can be tied directly to having a long QT interval other than the liability to develop torsad. Uh, so patients who have QT interval prolongation uh, either have no problem whatsoever or they suffer a catastrophic arrhythmia. And the problem with torsad is that it is a kink arrhythmia. In some patients, uh, if it's non-sustained, it can cause dizziness and syncope but not death. If it's not properly recognized or not treated, then it can eventuate in death, sudden death. Another big problem with this uh, prop with this area is that patients may simply die suddenly, uh, not obviously monitored at the time of their death. So implicating torsad in a sudden death is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, there's obviously lots of reasons why people die suddenly. It may have nothing to do necessarily with a drug-induced prorhythmic event. So the premise here is that the QT interval is a surrogate for risk for torsad. Um, and the issue here is that the, the real event that we care about is a rare event. Uh, in the course of a development of a new chemical entity, for example, it's very unusual to see a documented case of torsad, even if that drug has QT interval prolongation, and even if it subsequently does lead to torsad events in a real population. As an example, to exclude a relative risk of five times of torsad with cisapride uh, would have required over a million patient years of observation. 
in a clinical trial. Obviously, something that's almost impossible in the, in the context of modern clinical trials, being able to recruit that many patients and follow them for that long a period of time simply isn't going to work. And yet we know, obviously, that cisapride had that li has that liability, had that liability, and led to its withdrawal from the market. Another part of this premise uh, is that not only is there a linkage between QT interval prolongation and torsade, but the amount of QT prolongation, the, the extent of QT prolongation, uh, is important in determining the relative risk of developing proarrhythmic pro event, specifically torsade. So a drug that prolongs the QT interval by a small amount uh, is presumed to have less of a torsade liability than a drug that pro prolongs the QT interval by a larger amount. Um, and the amount of QT interval prolongation may be a function of drug exposure. We'll be talking about that as we go through this presentation. Uh, if that's true, that is, if drug exposure does have something to do with QT interval prolongation, then obviously pharmacokinetic principles such as changes in metabolism or elimination or distribution of drugs uh, may have a very important effect on liability to develop QT interval prolongation and thus torsade. So, uh, one of the principles uh, that we'll talk about and, and, and in some of the precedents that we'll talk about, the QT interval prolongation problem was only recognized uh, when drugs were co-administered with metabolic inhibitors or substrates for, metabolic, uh, for, sub for enzyme systems that could potentiate uh, drug exposure. Um, and we'll be looking at some of those examples as we go along. Uh, this is a list of some of the drugs that have had this liability. Um, we're not going to talk about all of them or even most of them. Just to point out that they are within several different kinds of drug classes. They're not necessarily cardiac drugs. One of the areas of angst here is that many of these drugs are prescribed by physicians who have very little sophistication in cardiology, let alone electrophysiology. Uh, so we would not expect um, a high level of expertise among gastroenterologists or neurologists um, or um, other physicians who prescribe these drugs for non-cardiac indications. And yet these drugs, the drugs that we have on the slide, clearly had the liability and, and needed to be withdrawn from the market. Uh, this is a quote of William Osler. Do not believe anything you read in the papers. If you see anything in the paper you know to be the truth, begin to doubt it immediately. Um, and clearly what had happened in this problem area is that the issue was grossly inflated by media coverage of the withdrawal of certain celebrated drugs. This is the um, Seldane terfenidine case example of a drug uh, that was withdrawn from the market because when it was used in uh, concert with a potent 3A4 inhibitor, exposures increased and the amount of QT interval prolongation obviously grossly increased, leading to um, several cases of sudden death and poor sod. Uh, when these cases do enter the public domain, uh, there's a, a good deal of uh, scrutiny given to it by uh, regulators as well as by uh, members of Congress and people in, um, people in high positions. And that visibility clearly leads to an increased amount of regulation. And, and was, it was after this and a few other celebrated cases that um, people really began to focus a tremendous amount of energy and interest on the QT interval issue. So based on all of that, um, through a number of consensus documents and deliberations among regulators uh, as well as by industry, um, the idea emerged that for new chemical entities, there would need to be a fairly intensive ECG evaluation of the drug to determine whether or not uh, it has the potential for causing torsade. Uh, no consensus as to what that um, signal might look like, um, but people pretty much agreed that it would be possible to study this question in healthy volunteers, and we'll talk a little bit about what these studies look like. Um, I would also mention here, and we'll talk about it a little bit as we go along, that um, the preclinical evaluation of the drug uh, 
was thought to be important, but not necessarily persuasive in making a decision about the liability the drug might have for producing QT interval prolongation. The problem we have with this area is that the QT interval is a difficult parameter to measure. Uh, there's a good deal of variability in the measurement. Uh, there's diurnal variability, there's variability uh, from it be among individuals and even within an individual. Uh, the measurement itself is not all that simple. There's a very strong heart rate dependence. Um, and as I said already, time is to, a, as a surrogate to a real clinical event, a very low uh, frequency is, is highly problematic. Um, I, I think one of the areas that has probably been um, emphasized uh, more than almost any other is heart rate, how heart rate variation impacts the QT interval. Uh, the, the fact is that for years we used a correction formula for the QT interval called Bayzettes uh, that, is, that has probably been inadequate. It does not properly correct the QT interval at the extremes of heart rate. Only recently have we seen the emergence of more refined correction formulae for the QT interval, including those that are on this slide. Uh, I would put forward that there is no correction formula that completely solves the problem of heart rate variance. And, and drugs that have a fairly profound effect on heart rate will always have some distortion in the measurement. Um, it's just a question of trying to limit the damage to some extent so that you can understand what the, the true QT effect is. There are lots of things that influence the QT interval that are uh, distracting to a clinical trial. Uh, I have some of them on this slide. Some of them it can be controlled for. Some of them can't. Um, some of them can be accounted for by the way that you randomize patients or enroll patients. Uh, just as one example, I think most people would now agree that um, in order to be able to ascertain the true effect of a drug on the QT interval that women as well as men need to be included in the, in the trials because there is a gender effect clearly evident for QT prolonging drugs. First of all, women tend to have longer QT intervals at rest, and during uh, pharmacologic provocation, they tend to have larger changes in QT interval than men. Um, and there's other, these other variables that certainly make a big difference and can confound the interpretation of data. Um, how does one go about solving the problem of the QT interval measurement? Well, um, there are methodologic things that one may be able to put into place. Um, I'm not, I, let me just um, divert for a second and make, make sure that everybody knows that I'm going to go through these slides, but I really want to leave a significant amount of time at the end of the presentation for questions because I know that there is going to be, there should be a number of questions about some of the things that I'm putting on these slides that I'm not going to have a chance to really expound upon. For example, there's a very large amount of interest in the concept of automating QT interval measurements, taking away some of the human error component. Whether that's better or not better has um, been highly debated and very controversial. But I think anybody would disagree that having central reading by a single reader uh, and, and having a large sample size and, and providing an opportunity for morphological interpretation, all of these things clearly enhance the ability to come to the truth as to whether a drug has a liability uh, to cause ventricular prorrhythmia. Um, just to bring this issue um, into kind of uh, bold relief, um, I'll just show you a little bit of data that uh, is uh, very it's sobering. Uh, first of all, uh, I can tell you that most physicians who practice cardiology and electrophysiology don't really pay a whole lot of attention to this problem area. They're not really aware of the whole QT issue. Uh, they don't really understand why somebody would try to measure the QT interval. They poo-poo the idea that, that a 10 millisecond change in QT interval is even detectable, let alone important. Uh, but what really is striking about uh, some of the contemporary data uh, is that, um, uh, and I apologize, this slide got a little scrambled in its, in, its, uh, in its reiteration, but what this is telling you is that measuring uh, the QT interval that non-cardiologists and even cardiologists 
have a very high error rate. This was a study in which Sammy Viskin gave out cardiograms to practitioners uh, that were uh, floridly normal uh, or floridly abnormal. And as you can see here, um, people who were so-called electrophysiology rhythm experts uh, had about a 62% correct rate. Uh, the QT, so-called QT experts, really didn't understand what they were looking at. But cardiologists and non-cardiologists really didn't have a chance. And, and they, they almost did worse than just taking a coin and flipping it. Um, let's skip that slide. Um, the other thing that I think many of us believe is that, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll go back to something I said earlier, is that we really haven't paid as much attention as we should to preclinical assessments. Um, I think that understanding a drug's liability in the preclinical setting is a major advantage in taking a drug forward into um, clinical trials, including even phase one trials. We'll be talking about thorough QT studies. Thorough QT studies are not inexpensive and they're not easy. And I think that if, the more you know about the drug preclinically, the better you are prepared to make a decision as to whether you want to even enter a phase one clinical trial in a thorough QT environment. Um, so non-clinical data, I think, are important. The U.S. regulators have been somewhat ambivalent about the importance of, of non-clinical data. Um, they've paid some attention to um, things like measuring uh, HERG and the HERG assay, measuring the effect of the drug on a particular potassium current, IKR. Uh, but in terms of looking at other models, uh, in vivo or in vitro models, uh, that might shed some light on the question, they've been a, a, a good deal less enthusiastic, perhaps a bit more enthusiasm for this among non-U.S. regulators than in, than in the U.S. The problem with preclinical models, first of all, there's a lot of them, uh, they, uh, they have some something to say. Each one has something to say for itself. But the biggest problem and the issue that's been raised by regulators is that they're not necessarily particularly well validated. And so um, we really need um, preclinical models, I think, that are not only scientifically valid, but also somewhat uh, clinically valid. And the only way to arrive at clinical validity, I think, is to take drugs that you know to be torsodogens or non-torsodogens and put them blindly into a model system and determine whether the model performs as the way it, the way it should. Now, as a, as a disclaimer, another disclaimer, uh, I am the head of a cardiology department in which we have a basic electrophysiology laboratory that does a lot of uh, work on drug-induced proarrhythmia. And, and our model is the myocardial wedge. So I, just so everybody understands that I have something of an ax to grind uh, because this is the model system that is in our laboratory. Um, my name has been on a number of publications that have had to do with the myocardial wedge preparation. So uh, just so you understand that the a bias here. But uh, this is a model that we think is particularly useful because it provides information about repolarization characteristics across the thickness of the ventricular myocardium. Uh, we think it's true that transmural dispersion of um, refractoriness is important in determining the uh, likelihood of the development of torsade. We think torsade is a transmural reentrant rhythm caused by disparity in repolarization across the ventricular wall. This is an example of uh, cisapride causing uh, long action potentials in the endocardial layer um, of this of a, a myocardial wedge preparation clearly leading to the propensity to develop torsad. Uh, the, the second slide here is on sodalol demonstrating again the same property of transmural dispersion, spontaneous early after depolarizations, and then spontaneous development of torsad in the setting not just of QT prolongation, which is obviously a prerequisite as you can see at the top, a uh, short, long, short initiation cycle and prolonged QT interval, but also in the presence of early after depolarizations and transmural reentry. Um, Gunjan Yan, who runs our laboratory and, and had, was instrumental in inventing the myocardial wedge, uh, 
has come up with a scoring system by which we can quantify the amount of repolarization abnormality caused by a drug, looking at QT integral prolongation, the amount of transmural dispersion, and then uh, the, the presence or absence of uh, early after depolarizations. Um, and using that scoring system, we did validate this model in a trial that was published in the Heart Rhythm Journal uh, about two years ago. With taking 15 compounds, uh, we were blinded to the identity of the compounds. Uh, the drugs were tested um, comprehensively in our laboratory, and the results were graded. Uh, and without beating this to death, uh, you can see that the drugs that are listed here, some of which known to be torsotogens, uh, like erythromycin, for example, or sparfloxacin, or cisapride. And you can see here that the torsad risk score was quite a bit higher in those drugs that we know to be torsotogens compared to drugs like captopril, for example, uh, or verapamil um, that um, do not cause torsotogen. In the case of verapamil, even though it causes QT prolongation, not known to be a torsotogen, you can see uh, in this model system does not give a high torsad score. We think um, that uh, this kind of information helps tremendously in making decisions about drugs that may have, for example, a positive HERG effect, um, but not necessarily uh, does it have um, any other information that leads you to believe that it could cause torsad. And making a decision about proceeding with clinical development, that obviously could be quite helpful. I'm going to skip this slide. And let me just, before I skip it, I'll just say that the, another issue that I think would be um, very important to discuss and consider is trying to understand individual susceptibility. Uh, I think one of the uh, one of the assumptions we've made in this whole area is that uh, clearly giving a QT prolonging drug um, to uh, patients uh, with um, uh, the vast majority of patients who have normal QT intervals isn't going to do anything. Um, there seem to be a small number of individuals within a population who may be particularly susceptible to the development of torsade when challenged with a QT prolonging drug. Uh, we, we hypothesize that these are people who uh, don't necessarily have the full-blown long QT syndrome but may have some element of the disease that make them susceptible. Uh, Dan Roden has coin this term of repolarization reserve. They have inadequate repolarization reserve. How do we go about identifying those individuals? Well, we can't yet. Uh, but the question is, might we be able to do that with either genetic testing or some element of drug challenge in the future? Uh, we certainly would um, love to know if that could be done, but uh, not something that we currently have available. I'm going to skip that slide. So. The recommendation currently in place is that for new chemical entities, there needs to be a thorough or pivotal study uh, of, the, of the QT interval in man. Um, this, will, this is the most important test in determining a new chemical entity's propensity to, to, to prolong the QT interval. And again, the assumption being that if the drug prolongs QT interval, it might have a torsad liability. Uh, correlation. There are several aspects of this trial that are noted here. Correlation with plasma concentrations to give you the ability to do some kind of a PKPD assessment um, using uh, the most updated and valid correction formulae for heart rate, uh, central blinded reading, and analyzing not only for the central tendency but also outlier analyses looking at the T-wave morphology as an index of propensity for tersud. Uh, looking at the drug across a very wide range of dose or exposure uh, with an active comparator, usually moxifloxacin, um, and then some clinical symptom assessment that usually in a thorough QT study, which is carried out in normal volunteers, really doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, the pitfalls of this kind of an approach uh, is, as I've already stated, is that it's not inexpensive. Um, that uh, what constitutes a positive study is everything. So where does one draw the line with regard to whether a study actually does or doesn't indicate that there may be a QT liability? Um, 
And then there are lots of situations where um, because of unfavorable kinetics or because of toxicity that giving large doses and producing large exposures for a drug may not be feasible in the context of a human volunteer study. And, and therefore, the, the classic therapeutic study design is, is uh, simply not feasible. Um, and, and of course, following the therapeutic study, what, what happens? What, is the, what are the next steps? Um, how does one integrate the results of a therapeutic study in the context of everything else that you know about the drug? Um, not only from the preclinical or non-clinical, but also in subsequent clinical development. Sometimes the therapeutic study um, is done after uh, there's been some information gathered about repolarization from other sources, uh, other trials, the other phase one and phase two clinical trials. Um, so the goal here, obviously, is to try to limit the potential for coming up with information which is contradictory or misleading. Um, in the current guidance uh, that's available, for the E14 document, um, I, I think that there's fairly good agreement that if one were to do a definitive QT study and arrive at a conclusion that there was not a signal, and how does one know that? It's by the defined uh, number of five. obtaining ECG information subsequently, but clearly uh, there is a reduced burden for those drugs that have uh, a so-called negative uh, definitive QT study. It certainly doesn't preclude the possibility of seeing a QT signal later on in development, although that's, that's not anticipated and not common. Um, and uh, it doesn't mean that one would be in a position to ignore cases in which there were a, a, long, a very long QT interval or um, an episode of ventricular proarrhythmia. Uh, that, that clearly would uh, uh, change the game in terms of the, the drug's development and whether one might be able to go forward or not. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. The flip side, of course, is a positive definitive QT study. Um, and here, um, the burden shifts to the sponsor to characterize the dose concentration and the time relationship under which one might expect to see QT interval prolongation in a target population at therapeutic and even at supertherapeutic doses and concentrations. So um, is there enough of a window uh, in which one would anticipate that you would not reach exposures that would place the patients at risk? Uh, what is the likelihood of obtaining in a, in a freestanding population high exposures? And another principle that's very important here is, are you going to be targeting patients who have known cardiovascular disease? Because again, the assumption is that the likelihood of developing ventricular proarrhythmia is grossly increased in individuals who do have cardiovascular disease. So, uh, in, a, in the presence of a positive study, um, it what happens to the drug in subsequent clinical development. Uh, so clinical events of interest, syncope, uh, lightheadedness, dizziness, um, obviously uh, sudden death or death that's unexplained or unexpected. Um, trying to understand within this context what, what is clinically important and what may not be important. 
uh, is is um, really kind of a requirement, and and it's a lot of these. Uh, it's a lot of this heavy burden that has dissuaded some sponsors from going forward with a drug that has a positive QT signal because the burden uh, in subsequent clinical development is fairly heavy. So um, monitoring for the development of index events during the subsequent clinical development of a drug, even if it has a negative thorough QT study, but certainly in the positive in the, in the in those for those drugs that have a positive QT signal, Again, these are some of the clinical events one might be on the lookout for uh, in, in trying to define whether patients uh, who have these events um, actually had them because of a ventricular proarrhythmia. Uh, it, this is a very difficult thing to sort out, um, even in the context of control trials. Once you get into phase four, where there's no control group and one's only looking at experience, um, trying to understand what, how to attribute clinical events to ventricular proarrhythmia is extraordinarily difficult. So just a few caveats as we wrap this up, um, just to make sure that we, we understand that we've spoken now for half an hour about the QT interval, but remember that proarrhythmic events can also occur by other mechanisms other than QT interval prolongation, just as an example. Uh, potent sodium channel blockers like the class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs have a liability for proarrhythmia in an ischemic substrate, and that's a totally different mechanism of proarrhythmia. Um, safe, to use a drug safely doesn't mean that the drug has a zero chance of causing torsade. Um, if one were to uh, develop a drug that had a very small QT effect, uh, demonstrable but small, doesn't necessarily preclude, preclude its clinical values since we may be talking about torsade incidence rates of less than one and 100 to 200,000 uh, patients exposed. In some therapeutic situations, uh, depending on the, on the benefit of the drug and the clinical indication, that may be perfectly acceptable. Uh, I'm not going to talk about QT shortening. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions about it. Um, QT um, there is a syndrome of short QT, the short QT syndrome that is associated with ventricular fibrillation and sudden death. It's an extraordinarily rare clinical syndrome. Um, the mechanisms by which short QT generates ventricular fibrillation are so probably somewhat different than the mechanisms that we have just talked about in QT interval prolongation. There's never been uh, demonstration of a drug that shortens the QT interval causing a ventricular proarrhythmia, although there are drugs that can shorten the QT interval. There are certain anti-epileptics, um, for example, that can shorten the QT interval, uh, but not, that's not necessarily translated into uh, liability. Nonetheless, in doing thorough QT studies, it's possible during the course of a thorough QT study to define uh, QT shortening. Um, I guess it's very important to discriminate what um, a QT signal might mean to a drug in terms of its approvability. Um, I think for the most part, for the vast majority of drugs that I've had an opportunity to look at, um, having QT interval prolongation usually does not go down to approvability. Um, what it goes down to is uh, obviously it constitutes a risk. Uh, and in cases where the QT interval prolongation is large um, and the clinical benefit is, is not so great, it certainly could go down to approvability. But for the vast majority of drugs that make it to late stage clinical development, if a drug has had a QT effect, um, it's usually not a large effect. And it usually is something that's ha handled not necessarily as an approvable issue, but more in labeling so that um, practitioners understand how best to use the drug and in which patients to use the drug in order to maximize its benefit uh, without exposing patients to undue risk. So I think this is more of a labeling issue. What that labeling looks like is highly variable. In some cases, the labeling is uh, descriptive, and in, other it, in others, it's, it's much more ominous in terms of 
where it's put in the package insert and what the wording for that package insert might be. Um, I think that at the end of the day, um, even though there are severe limitations to doing phase four studies in this realm, um, the opportunity to really understand the prorhythmic potential for a drug that's released that has a QT interval prolongation, the only way one's going to be able to recognize that is with a comprehensive surveillance program. Um, the conventional way of doing phase four studies is probably not optimal. But in the future, having large databases of patients who have highly characterized clinical parameters and are followed for a long period of time, uh, comparing incidence of sudden death, for example, in those populations, for, in those patients who are or may not be exposed to these drugs, may be a way forward. Um, there's not a whole lot of precedent for this, uh, but um, we're certainly hopeful that with improved registration of patients in in uh, data sets that we'll be able to pull this off. Uh, he is the best physician, knows the worthlessness of the most medicines. Remembering that although we're focusing on ventricular proarrhythmia and QT interval prolongation during this presentation, there are lots of things that drugs can do to impact cardiac safety. And um, in, this, in this new world of being riveted on cardiac safety, um, it, one must not ignore the possibility uh, that drugs may have other mechanisms for harm, um, either because of their vascular effects or their inotropic effects or their effects on other ion channels. Uh, all these things are very important. And again, uh, preclinical development may give you some signal as to where you need to turn most of your attention. So the last slide is, is just a reminder. This is kind of the most commonsensical slide of all, uh, is that it is all about benefit risk. And um, uh, the, the uniqueness of patient benefit, um, the um, ability to uh, put into place uh, reasonable safeguards uh, and mitigate risk is extremely important in making decisions about, as I said, approvability and then even product labeling. Um, the uh, amount of risk that, that a drug may have obviously is proportional to how the drug is used in clinical practice. One, one doesn't worry nearly as much about a drug that's used for a few days, like an antibiotic, as drugs that may be used for long periods of time, especially, again, in patients who are elderly who have a lot of heart disease. So all of these things need to be taken into account. Um, what, what I would hope is that taking a very methodical approach uh, to this problem area will help uh, all of us uh, come to the proper decision with regard to how one handles patients um, with, uh, uh, with drugs that have potential cardiac toxicity. So I'm going to stop there, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Um, so uh, we have one that's already up. Um, what property of a drug results in QTC prolongation or positive HERG effects? Well, th this, the, the, that's two different questions. The HERG issue is very specific to a particular ion channel called IKR. Um, there is a control long QT syndrome, uh, long QT, LQT2, uh, that is known to be um, a genetic mutation that affects uh, potassium current, potassium movement across that particular uh, membrane um, uh, pore. Um, and therefore, uh, this is a very measurable effect uh, one can make to see whether or not a drug has an effect on that particular ion current. Drugs that have a relatively low IC50 for HERG effect would be expected to have the potential liability of prolonging the QT interval. The correlation between the HERG assay and actual QT interval prolongation in a thorough QT study is, is fairly good, but it, it certainly is not perfect. And the exceptions go in both directions. Drugs that one would predict might have a QT effect based on the HERG result uh, sometimes don't, and vice versa. Um, nevertheless, I think that most as a practical matter, most um, sponsors these days are paying attention to these early preclinical signals uh, 
uh, especially if there's the opportunity to move among candidate drugs with similar chemical structure and activity uh, to find a drug that perhaps is less liable to have this effect in order to minimize the chances of the trouble later. With regard to um, QT interval prolongation in general, since um, other since an effect on other ion currents can cause QT interval prolongation, uh, the correlation with those kinds of drugs is even worse with HERG. Uh, so I think um, I would use the HERG assay as a general index, but in those cases where uh, I needed to know more, as I've already mentioned, I think there are other preclinic models that might be brought to bear. Um, Another question that we've been asked is, how do you estimate adequate sample size for a definitive QTC study in healthy subjects? Well, um, that's actually been fairly well worked out based on the effect size from oxyfloxacin. Remember, that's the positive comparator. So you, see you clearly need to have an effect size that will allow you to see it at the minimum at the lower boundary of the 95% confidence interval greater than 5 milliseconds from oxyfloxacin in order to demonstrate um, that uh, one has, has assay sensitivity. It turns out that uh, the answer to the question is variable depending on the design. So if one were able to do a single high-dose thorough QT study with a crossover, the number of individuals that need to be entered into the study are somewhere in the range of about 40 to 60 subjects. The problem emerges is if you need to do a parallel study of multiple doses or uh, parallel with placebo and moxifloxacin, since using a parallel design introduces more variability in the subjects, since you're using different subjects, um, the, num the, the number of patients in each, or number of subjects in each arm goes up, uh, so that one is now talking about in each arm somewhere in the range of 30 to 50 subjects. So if one were to have in a parallel study uh, two doses of the drug, placebo, and then a with the positive comparator in parallel, one could, one could get up to two or 300 patients. And that's where the expense starts to come in, especially if you can't do it um, in a crossover design, especially if you need to do, or you can't do it in a relatively short dosing interval. If you need to dose patients over several days, you can see that the expense would increase extraordinarily. Next question. Um, it seems using the thorough QT to assess torsad uh, maybe imprecise. Um, what, uh, what, if, if this is the current standard, uh, how does one go about um, overcoming this, this limitation? Um, I guess what I would, what, what I believe, and I, I have to say that I was kind of, I was very skeptical about whether the ThoroQT design itself uh, would help us to understand um, the, uh, the liability for torsad. I've been very impressed, actually, when these studies are done correctly, the precision with which the QT interval can, in fact, be measured. Uh, so I, I'm not so uh, negative about the, the idea that you can measure the QT interval very precisely in a thorough QT design. For most drugs, you can. Where my skepticism is is, is what we attribute in terms of risk to that QT interval prolongation. So what really does mean if a drug prolongs the QT interval 5 milliseconds or by 10 milliseconds or by 15 milliseconds, how much does one increment the risk? And in any given patient population, what is the risk? And how does one make these assessments? It's based on what we know about drugs that have a much larger effect on QT interval we, we haven't really been able to nail this down as well as we'd like. And that's where my skepticism comes in. And that's why, again, it, it opens up the whole air issue of benefit-risk. A uh, small increase in QT interval, look at moxifloxacin, for example, a drug that we know prolongs the QT interval reliably, but, but in a measurable way. That drug's used all the time clinically for, as an intravenous as well as oral drug for acute infections. And, uh, we don't seem to fret about it a good deal, even though we know it has a QT effect. Um, next question is, can you do an intensive ECG assessment early in development uh, to get an early read? The answer is absolutely yes, you can. Um, it really 
isn't even all that hard to do. It it requires some uh, it requires some discipline uh, and uh, some uh, careful design in order to make sure that you're not going to arrive at a bad conclusion or an improper an, or an improper conclusion or wrong conclusion. Um, so, for example, the intensity of ECG monitoring needs to be appropriate. Uh, you probably do need to get multiple ECGs at, at, at whatever predefined time points. The measurements of the QT interval need to be made when you expect high concentrations. Um, they need to be read centrally. Uh, it would be best to have individuals who have very little cardiac disease because their T waves are much more likely to be normal and, and the QT interval much more valid. Their heart rates won't vary quite as much. So there's, there are a lot of provisos that go into, into my answer, but my answer is absolutely yes because um, depending on what you see in that kind of a trial, if it's really well done and you can rely on the data, uh, you may make a decision based on that information to go forward or not go forward with, with uh, a new chemical entity. The next question is, what will it take to have the automated QT methods accepted by the FDA? Um, I, I think it's going to take um, some case examples. I think um, there, the FDA will want to see some studies carried out in an automated way um, that uh, come up with an answer that looks uh, plausible and reliable. Um, in fact, that's not my supposition. The FDA has said that in public forums, that they're not opposed to the idea of automation. In fact, if you think about it, the way QT intervals measure these days is, is at least semi-automated. Uh, it's not, it's not, these ECGs are not paper read with calipers. I mean, these are ECGs that are put up on screens and uh, there's, there's some automation in, by technicians in looking at the QT interval. And the question is, can you move further down the line and remove even the technician from this measurement except for pulling out those, those um, tracings that have problems either because of technical issues or outlier analyses. Um, but I, I'm totally optimistic that uh, this will happen. There are a number of companies that have um, uh, entered into this proposition. Uh, the economics are going to drive it because obviously uh, this should be a much less expensive way of conducting the trials. Um, and so far the data that we've seen have been very good in terms of correlations between the QT intervals measured in this more standard fashion and the automated fashion. So I, I think it's just a matter of time um, and a matter of uh, kind of getting over the hump. The next question is, uh, is there a role for non-ECG assessment of risk for Tortsad? Uh, for example, abnormal LV relaxation on echo or uh, a biomarker of fibrosis? Um, as I said earlier, um, I think that there are clearly examples of drugs that have provoked um, cardiac toxicity independent of the QT Tortsad effect. And I think that one can use other methods to define uh, what that risk might be. But specifically with regard to the question of QT interval of torsade, since QT interval prolongation is a prerequisite for torsade, um, then I think um, the QT interval measurement is, is the minimum amount of information that needs to be obtained. Uh, how one might be able to augment the risk assessment um, is certainly a very important scientific question, but it's going to be extremely difficult to answer. And the reason is because of the event rates. Again, we're talking about event rates that are very, very, very low. Uh, and to tie QT interval measurement with some other, with a, some other surrogate marker to the torsade event rate uh, would would be extremely difficult to do. So, uh, I, although I think it's a great idea scientifically, and one might be able to bring that along preclinically, validating it in a in a real life clinical trial would be extraordinarily difficult. 
Um, the next question was, can you give examples of bad QTC design? Well, anytime people wander off the path and, and don't do all of the things that we've already talked about in terms of large numbers of ECGs centrally read, all the other stuff that we've said, um, uh, there, there's the potential for uh, a misunderstanding and uh, obtaining information that is not interpretable. Um, in those situations where people have used uh, a positive comparator that's not well recognized or not, um, not giving appropriate doses of a positive comparator, uh, one example that came up not that long ago was over-encapsulation of moxifloxacin. Big concern that by, by trying to blind the studies and over-encapsulate moxifloxacin to preserve the blind, that one was actually inhibiting uh, the bi or reducing the bioavailability of the drug and making it less available may mean that you got a smaller moxifloxacin effect and uh, assay sensitivity was um, in question. Um, but there are lots of ways that one may be able to mess this up. Another example is not using high enough concentrations of the proprietary drugs. Um, uh, wimping out a bit in terms of selecting the high dose so that one doesn't cover all the possible concentrations that might be achievable in the clinical context. Uh, that certainly makes the interpretation of the QT study quite problematic. Uh, all kinds of technical issues in terms of ECG acquisition, uh, having ECGs acquired uh, with a lot of artifact um, makes interpretation quite difficult. One of the things that's really helped a good deal is the using the digital halter technology so that one has, it, it, one has the opportunity to use um, ECG tracings um, that may be of higher quality within the same time frame uh, without having to worry about whether that one particular ECG that was obtained at the most critical time point has technical value. So there's lots of ways that one can um, wander off the path and end up with a um, result that is uninterpretable. Um, looking to see whether there are any other questions. I don't see any others coming up. We'll give it a minute. Um, there's a very interesting question that's just been put up on the board that I, I kind of glossed over to one of my slides. Uh, People who have the phenotype of, of um, QT sensitivity be used at, for cardiac safety assessments. Um, and that's a really great question. Um, and I, I've heard this question discussed by several people. I think Doug Zipes brought this up at a meeting a few years ago, and we had a very lively discussion. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I think that if you were to take individuals that you knew, for example, had Q, uh, the QT syndrome, long QT syndrome, but they were, they didn't have long, very long QT measurements, and they had never had a clinical event, that that would be a, a, a wonderful individual in whom to test a drug that might have a small QT effect to see whether or not it's magnified an individual at risk. Um, Obviously, the, the major question here is the ethics of doing what we just suggested. That is, even if you could convince somebody that had the long QT trait to do this, would it, is it something ethical, something that you should even propose? Um, the, the argument in favor of doing it is it's for the greater good. The likelihood of this person having a true torsade event is probably pretty small. Um, and even if they did, if it were done in a very controlled setting, uh, their, their, their chances of being able to resuscitate them were enormously high. But the, but the, the other side of the argument is it's not 100% that you'll resuscitate, number one. And number two, um, it, placing this kind of a burden on an individual is, is, uh, is or proposing it to somebody like that, um, may place them in a, in a situation where they feel like they almost have to agree to it because of the societal good. Um, so the, the answer is, I think that if we were able to do this, um, 
that we would learn a tremendous amount. Um, and I'm not necessarily opposed to the idea, but I, but I think that we have not really been able to get a consensus as to whether it's a, an, ethical, um, an ethical thing to do. Um, another question about automation. Um, this again has to do with our automated algorithms. How does one go about validating them? The only way to really validate them is to compare them with uh, the more conventional way of making the measurements. Um, again, it'd be great if we could tie this to the thing we really care about, which is Torsad, but that'll never happen. So um, the, the way that the, the methods, the validation methods have gone are that these, these, these automated methodologies have been put into um, studies in which individuals are exposed to drugs that, that do in fact have a QT effect, like thorough QT studies. The moxifloxacin or positive comparator arm there is obviously very important. You want to make sure that the automated system has the capability of detecting small changes in QT, small but nevertheless important changes in QT interval. And uh, these studies are in the literature uh, for a number of the automated systems. And there obviously is a publication bias. I guess if these things didn't work, nobody would publish the data. But the data that are in the literature look pretty encouraging. We'll see if we have any others. We'll wait for a moment um, before we conclude. We're getting close to the conclusion time, however. I'm not seeing any other questions come up, so let me just, I'll just take one minute to summarize. Uh, I think that this is a, a, an extremely important area uh, to discuss. I'm glad that there were a lot of people on the line and we had some uh, a good interchange. Um, there's the reason is that one particular and very important aspect of cardiac safety, I think the developments over the last few years have increased our comfort that we are not exposing patients on a wholesale basis to the risk of ventricular proarrhythmia by, by giving them drugs that could have an effect on QT interval that is unknown. Um, that's the good side. The bad side is uh, that this, this um, um, obsessive attention to the QT interval has, has led to perhaps not as much attention being paid to other aspects of cardiac and even non-cardiac safety of new drugs. Uh, I hope that we haven't become so maniacal about this that we, that we have lost the forest for the trees. Uh, and I would encourage people, as, as I said earlier, to, to take a really kind of full view approach to cardiac safety in the, develop, in the early development of drugs, not just riveting on the QT interval. Um, but, I think the QT interval story can be used as an object lesson for how we learned about a good deal about the science of the problem, and then use that science to translate into uh, clinical trials that have provided some important answers. Um, there's one last question here. What can be considered small but still significant change? I've used the word small and significant several times, and I'll just make sure that everyone's clear that in the guidances, it's five milliseconds. And how does one define a five millisecond change in QT interval by excluding an upper bounds of 10 milliseconds and the 95% confidence interval? And uh, that, that is kind of where the standard has been set. Greater than that, there's some concern. Less than that, there isn't. Um, again, whether or not um, this uh, uh, is scientifically valid or not uh, um, can be debated. So I'm going to end there. I want to, again, thank everyone for your attention over the last hour. Um, and uh, glad you were able to join. And hopefully we'll have a chance to interact again in the not-too-distant future. Thank you.